So welcome to lecture two covering the senses. We will be discussing the sense of smell as well as taste, which are very similar as far as how they act. To begin with, the sense of smell, we'll be talking about olfactory receptors, which are basically nerve endings or neurons that connect into what's called the olfactory nerve um, with these long cilia that project off of them. Now, a chemical that you inhale has to be dissolved inside the mucus and then it will bind to tiny protein receptors on those cilia causing a chemical change that will ultimately start an action potential or the transmission of the electrical impulse down the nerve. And that's going to run off to the brain where you're going to interpret that smell as either being something pleasing to you or something negative to you. It's pretty universal uh, for humans. So once you've started by binding the chemical, then you take off down the olfactory nerve to the brain, and that's where you're going to interpret it. Now, once again, keep in mind this interpretation can vary, and you know not everyone's going to have the same sense of smell, but in general, most people will respond negatively to, say, the sense of smell of, of rotting flesh. You know, that's not something you, you go up to and go, man, that smells good, I'd like to eat that. But a fly would or a vulture. So smell does not reside in the chemical. And the smell resides in the evolved brain. So you've evolved a interpretation of those chemicals and it keeps you away from things that are bad, attracts you to things that are good like the smell of flowers and sweet fruit and things of that nature. A thousand genes, over a thousand actually, coding for smell receptors, these tiny little proteins that bind to so many various chemicals. Obviously we don't have receptors for everything. Uh, carbon monoxide gas is colorless and odorless and there are many things we cannot smell. Um, we are mammals so we have a very good genetic smell. However, many of these genes are turned off or deactivated so the question becomes why? And it's got a neat evolutionary story as well. Uh, we are very sight based. About 70 percent of your sensory receptors coming from vision. So sense of smell is not as important to us as perhaps it once was or as to say a bear or something like that or a dog. Now, you may have the same number of genes but many of them are fossilized. And this is not uncommon in biology. Um, we actually have a fossilized gene that would produce vitamin C for us. It's inactivated. It's there. It just doesn't work. So fossilized. In the, in the genome and we have to take in our vitamin C through our diet whereas other species have active versions of that gene and can actually produce it without having to take it in from the diet. So smell is something we've kind of lost over time. Uh, we're not really running around tracking down our food anymore or you know sniffing for where the saber-toothed tiger is or anything like that. This is a nice image here of the cilia down in the nasal mucosa in the concha here. So the smell comes in the nose, it dissolves in the mucus and on these cilia will be tiny little protein cell membrane bound receptors that will bind to certain chemicals. That binding chemoreceptor starts an action potential that's going to go down the olfactory nerve and ultimately to our brain here for interpretation. It's a more blown up image. You can see this mucus, the cilia what you're not seeing here is the proteins, but you can picture a chemical dissolving in the mucus binding and say it's the smell of a rose. Cause an action potential electrical impulse to travel down the nerve. There's the cell body. And down our axons and then you're going to release a neurotransmitter. Tells the next nerve to fire and you continue that action potential all the way down the olfactory nerve to the olfactory cortex of your brain. This is the receptors I'm talking about. Now, we don't get into G proteins as heavily in anatomy and physiology as we do in like a course in major biology, but the vast majority of your medications act on proteins like these. So our chemical here binds to a receptor that would be on that cilia. So here's our cell membrane, our little phospholipid bilayer. The binding causes this protein to change as well. And you see GTP is adding on, this activates it. It then activates another protein, in this case adenylate cyclase, which then activates a very common second messenger called cyclase.
then that's going to open up channels for depolarization, which would be the start of an action potential. Uh, so it's the binding of the chemical, say the rose smell, that activates this little pathway here that ultimately turns the nerve on. That's why we call it the chemoreceptor. And you don't have to memorize adenylate cyclase and cyclic AMP, but you'll see this throughout our lectures on the senses and throughout biology. G protein coupled receptors, very, very common and do many, many, many things in the body. So everything we learn goes back to those first lectures in AMP1 about, you know, the protein receptors and cell membranes and DNA and all these molecules and things, and ultimately back to chemistry. So I've taken time here to break down smell into as basic a level as I could put it for you. So if you follow this reading, uh, this is the basics of smell. You get a chemical dissolving in your mucus, binding to the olfactory receptors, and through that G protein action, opening up an action potential, you're going to travel down your olfactory nerve to the olfactory cortex, and that's where your brain's going to interpret that smell as either being pleasant or repulsive, whatever that may be. Taste, very similar. We'll change a few words here and there. Works basically the same way as smell because it is a chemoreceptor. So for taste, the cells we're going to be talking about are actually called gustatory cells. And this is our taste receptors. Um, and you also have basal cells which are producing, and this is epithelial tissue, so pretty high mitotic rate here. Off these gustatory cells are these tiny little hairs, almost like the cilia we were just talking about with smell. And when chemicals are dissolved in saliva and bind to these hairs, same basic process, action potential gets started. You travel down various nerves, in the case of taste, also into the brain for interpretation. So if you follow here, you see the facial nerve, glossopharyngeal, vagus. All three of these cranial nerves are involved in sending information about taste to the brain, ultimately to the gustatory cortex for interpretation. So you can see how similar this is. Taking a picture here, you can see the little tiny hairs, um, our gustatory cells, our taste cells. So when chemicals bind here, action potential down the nerves, ultimately to the brain for interpretation. It's another blown up picture here of the gustatory cells, little hair cells. This is real life image down here at the bottom. So you can see the artist's representation versus what an actual slice of your tongue would look like under a microscope. So for the most part, when you look in your biology textbooks, you know, college level, the drawings are relatively accurate representations of what it looks like in real life. Taste just like smell is binding to a G protein pathway. So uh, one other interesting fact about smell I have to mention is and, and taste and how they're interrelated. Um, taste being a G protein pathway, smell being a G protein pathway and going to similar regions of the brain is that smell actually influences taste. So if you cut off the sense of smell, taste changes. There are other things involved in, you know, your ultimately your taste. You know, how hot is it? How cold is it? Um, what's the spice level? Okay, so there's variations in taste here. Uh, texture. You know, sometimes it's not really the taste of the food, right? It's the texture that throws you off. You hear that many times when people talk about taste or any of those shows on TV where they're cooking like Gordon Ramsay or something like that. Very basics of taste broken down here just like smell. Chemical dissolves in your saliva, binds to hair cells on the gustatory cells. This is basically called our, our taste buds. That stimulates an action potential down, in this case, I just said several cranial nerves instead of naming all three, to the gustatory cortex of the brain where you interpret that taste as either being good or bad. Just like smell, this is something where it's pretty universal, sweet, you know, sugary foods, fatty foods typically taste good to most humans. Um, bitter foods, things that, you know, might indicate poison typically taste bad. Um, so you would, you know, pick that up, maybe taste of a certain berry and then immediately spit it out. Whereas, you know, you might not spit out a, a cherry or an apple or something like that that's actually good for you. 
Lecture three will cover hearing and equilibrium, uh, and then lecture four after that will cover vision. Those two are more intensive, let's just say, than smell or taste.